uh, really interesting, um, you know, as, as parents are, are asking, uh, what's the cause of, of autism? If it's not um, the immunizations, well, what, what is the cause of it? And uh, uh, we have the um, Scandinavians to thank. Uh, and, and you'll see several of these studies come from their large database uh, in that, uh, that country. Um, and they have a database where they also have um, who's related to one another for uh, about three generations. And by reviewing this large database, they are confirming, first of all, that we're talking about a heritable condition. And they they come up with an estimate of 85% of it's heritable. The literature somewhere between 64 and 91%. So that's that's about what, what people have been thinking about. And in this study, it was particularly interesting to me because they wanted to see uh, if there was going to be a maternal genetic contribution. That is something uh, that uh, the mother particularly contributes maybe while she was pregnant, she had a, a diabetes or she was obese or there was an immune problem. And, and these were some studies that uh, uh, were um, making these arguments. And so, so they simply <clears throat> looked at um, uh, the likelihood of having autism if a relative has autism. And uh, first thing that's clear is that we're talking about a uh, additive kind of model. That is, if you have uh, a more severe autistic uh, uh, person in your family, uh, you're more likely to have a relative who has it. So, so it's um, um, it, it's uh, not uh, a yes no, but it's uh, how much is in the family. So low severity. On the other hand, uh, autistic. Uh, uh, individuals have uh, their relatives are more likely to be mild, and uh, and even uh, if you are a half sibling but of a severe, uh, severely autistic person, you're more likely to have autism than uh, just as probabilities than if there uh, was a low severity person in the family. So in uh, uh, looking at this data they were clever about trying to figure out the maternal genetic contribution because they had uh, half spins and cousins who were not sharing the mother's genetic contribution. And uh, they couldn't eliminate the possibility there was a small maternal genetic contribution. There's something happening, but it's not explaining uh, very much of the variation. Um, and then the other thing that comes out in, in the, this examination of uh, uh, this large database is this broad autistic phenotype again. And that includes uh, social communication. And uh, Dr. Kanner, when, uh, that, uh, when he uh, uh, talk, first uh, talked about autism, um, uh, talked about the uh, refrigerator parent. He thought maybe. It was uh, due to the way the children were parented, and that that's uh, no longer uh, any, anyone not thinking that in terms Ray, of Ray, can I just autistic Ray, kids. Yes. Ray, it's Emily. Can I just clarify? Yes. That isn't what Connor said. Connor didn't ever call that, think that it was about that the way they were. What he described was that the parents have similar issues, that they are aloof. Um, well, and, I, I, that's just what I was going to say. Okay. I, I, no, I, I don't I want to. That, Anybody that, in fact, that it was poor parenting that leads to autism, because there were Very other good. who did blame parents for that, like Bettelheim and others. Right, right. They took his observations and and they 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 decided it was causative, and that's been attributed to him. And I thank you, uh, Emily. But but in fact, his observations are really uh, borne out by. The uh, idea that that some of the parents may have been in the broad autism uh, phenotype. Um, so, so, um, so that's what we've learned about. Uh, that we're learning that this is uh, mostly a genetic thing, and it's uh, not a yes/no. It's, it's a, um, how much load, genetic load we have. But then uh, we're faced with these uh, issues that come up. Are there some kind of um, uh, factors in the environment or in the 
maternal factors that could uh, explain a small amount of the variation and maybe uh, potentiate some of the genetic load that you already have. And this is one example in the recent literature where it's, it looked like uh, maternal folic acid or multivitamin use uh, even before or during the pregnancy lowered the risk for, uh, for autism, except in mothers with mental health disorders. Now, <clears throat> why would that make any sense? <clears throat> except in mental health disorders. Well, a, a really uh, another very large database, this is this consortium, uh, genome-wide association data, they've got 265,000 patients. And they are looking not just at autism, but they were looking at a variety of other behavioral psychiatric uh, conditions. <clears throat> and they have a, a bunch of data on this population, including uh, whether they had a neurologic disorder and some uh, medical disorders like Crohn's disease or heart attacks or things like that. And what is, is really interesting is uh, the overlap between uh, the various psychiatric conditions um, counting autism as one, and even behavioral descriptions, so that the notion was that maybe these diagnoses aren't, uh, aren't specific. Uh, maybe, you know, we're talking about a broad phenotype, but also these things are related, and particularly when you compare it to neurologic disorders that are not uh, uh, correlated. And let me just show you uh, uh, some ways they portray this. And these, when you see the boxes that have color in it and, and, and stars even more so, you're seeing relationships between all of these uh, uh, mental health disorders. And then when you look a little further, this is an interesting, and let me explain it to you. <clears throat> these are not just, these are diagnoses, but these are just descriptions of people like uh, openness, depressive symptoms, subjective well-being even. And you see that there are a lot of boxes that are colored in. Compared to over here, uh, generalized epilepsy and um, uh, where was it? Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's, yes, it's related to some uh, years of education and all, all some of these circumstances and status factors. But look at this, the lack of of any coloring, uh, this is height, for uh, any of these other conditions, whereas you see these mental health conditions uh, the, uh, lot lighting up uh, with, with uh, uh, relationships to other kind of mental health behavioral kinds of conditions. So there's, uh, so it's, it's an overlap of, um, uh, so, so when you see, and this is another article from last year, they said, okay, well, there's autism, ADHD, and anxiety, and mood, and they're related. And we looked at this, uh, this was actually a, a network of uh, uh, aut uh, parents of autistic children, tend to be a little, little more on the severe side, but they, in this sample, they said, well, 43% had ADHD also, and the older they are, the more likely to have acquired that diagnosis. And then uh, the relationship, if you have ADHD and uh, uh, ASD, uh, you're more likely to have uh, uh, anxiety disorder and, and mood disorder. And I, it didn't, uh, this didn't come out, this is a pediatric study, but I'm, uh, maybe a family could comment on this. I think that uh, in the adult, when you read about adult autistic uh, individuals, you're more likely to hear about depression than uh, Children, um, is that is that true, uh, uh, Emily? Um, uh, I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, that, that was my impression. I, I see it when you talk about adults, but but anyhow, for a primary primary care, you know, it's not surprising that all these things go together. They're all related to one another, so. Uh, you can expect to see this whole family of, of problems and, and, uh, uh, and uh, there's things in there that are, look like, okay, those are primary care conditions. We treat uh, insomnia and uh, stuff like that. And so it's not a surprise that in um, 
uh, recent pub recent literature there was a Cochrane report <clears throat> you know that they that's the group that gets gathers together and says is there enough evidence to decide that we should uh, have a certain uh, clinical practice or not and um, and they said well uh, how about uh, using stimulants for ADHD symptoms in uh, children with autism and so it, they said yes there's there is strong evidence that uh, using stimulants for people with autism helps what does it help it helps the hyperactivity and attention and there it, it was less strong data for impulsivity a little harder to to define with some of these kids um, but it the other point is it doesn't make the core symptoms of, of autism worse. Uh, and, and particularly, it doesn't uh, benefit uh, autism as the core symptoms of social interaction. It didn't help the stereotypic uh, behaviors or overall uh, autism uh, uh, functioning, if, if you will. Um, uh, so so um, uh, the fact that um, they also have autism. Doesn't surprise us that they have ADHD. We know these are all things in a, uh, not only a continuum of the phenotype, but a continuum through, through behavioral and uh, mental health conditions. Um, so, and then uh, there was a, uh, uh, another recent study that I thought um, I just, uh, uh, this may have been a, a drug trial, but it was it was impressive that uh, they tried uh, melatonin. Now, certainly following a trial of behavioral intervention and <laughs> getting, you know, just to mention uh, uh, autistic kids even more than uh, uh, every child uh, needs a good bedtime routine and uh, uh, for them to settle down at night, but. Uh, following that, uh, uh, individuals with autism are a little more prone to in, insomnia and, and uh, um, the biological rhythm disturbance. Uh, so they tried melatonin, and um, so that's something we would do. And, and what was, uh, you know, that's ordinary kind of um, uh, medicine, just like the, like uh, the stimulants, or ordinary medicine. But there's a little bit of a twist here that that uh, with these autistic kids. Even though they were older kids, they may not have taken the pill so well. So they wanted to have one that was chewable. And they have one two and five milligram one. And they got an average of one hour of extra sleep. And they showed that the short acting, um, they got to sleep, but they were um, waking up more. And that's what we were hoping for for the long acting ones. I haven't found as, as good evidence for, for this as, as uh, here. It's called um, PED. PRM, and I'm not sure, and I just was reading about this recently, and I can't attest that I've been try using this, but um, there you are, uh, primary care uh, treatment for autistic kids. So, <clears throat> talking about the genetic cause, and um, what kind of, what's our obligation, and what is primary care obligation to do a genetic workup? Let's say we screen them and they're positive, and uh, we're seeing a family. Now, the American Academy of Neurology and uh, uh, Child Neurology Society, uh, they uh, don't recommend testing for all children with autism. Instead, they require a comorbid diagnosis of intellectual disability, the more severe ones, and uh, presence of dysmorphic features you should look for, a family history uh, suggesting uh, fragile X, that is, or male affected uh, relatives. Uh, on the other hand, you've got the American College of Medical Genetics, and not surprisingly, actually, that um, they say a genetic evaluation should be offered to every person with ASD or his or her family. Um, and then there's AAP, <clears throat> and they recommend specifically that. Um, uh, uh, it's testing, a specific testing should be offered to all uh, patients. 
and the uh, chromosomal uh, microarray is what they're talking about uh, in the last recommendation. Somebody have uh, want to add something? There? No, that's all. Uh, yeah. So um, a chromosomal microarray uh, is the chromosomal deletions and duplications um, and the uh, uh, hit rate. So uh, is um, somewhere between 2.3 and 9.6 percent are going to have a positive test. So what should we be ordering that? And then around the corner, it's uh, now uh, becoming available. And uh, a number of, I've noticed, commercial uh, genetic testing groups is this whole exome sequencing. And, and that's, we're talking here about those, those, the subset of genes that encode proteins. And those are the ones that are thought to um, make, uh, carry most of the heritability for um, uh, syndromes. Um, and so if you do that, you get another 8.4%. And coming our way sometime soon, I think at this point, uh, out of reach and uh, very expensive, is a whole genome sequencing. Now that's your whole DNA. You get your whole DNA, that should um, tell the story. And that so far, the data is 15.8%. Other people have said 30 to 40%. Depends on, on uh, perhaps how severe the cases are uh, that you're referring. Uh, it, it would seem like that's the whole story, but we have to realize that it may not tell the story about epigenetic factors. That, uh, so what do we do? And what do parents expect? And what do they think about this? Um, they, uh, so there have been some surveys of parents, and uh, they, first there is this financial burden uh, because it, it can be expensive. Insurance may not cover it. They may get an unfair, they, they say, well, it may be an unfavorable diagnosis. That'd be a problem with it. But maybe there'd be an unfavorable change of treatment. That's, that's in the minds of the parents. But, but um, the, this one here, when they talk about getting interpretation of a negative study or variants of unknown significance, that doesn't make people completely happy in the, from parents' point of view. But the benefits, uh, some parents said, it's nice to know it wasn't something we did. That's, that's a biggie. And, um, and then maybe they, they feel like they'll have access to additional resources and they'll have some knowledge of a definitive diagnosis and maybe there'll be additional treatment options. That's what they're uh, hoping for. And so then they did some, there's another study uh, where they did a survey last year of, of pediatricians in Utah. And in Utah, 21% um, said all children should be referred for genetic testing. And, uh, and then there was 49% said, uh, well, some kids. And then uh, do you do a genetic discussion? Always 9%, never 28%. What are the barriers? Um, uh, lack of insurance coverage, cost and insurance coverage. And, and if you, if you do it, then, uh, obtaining authorization, prior authorization. Uh, a lot of pediatricians have been through that and that was painful. Um, and then there's lack of confidence in ordering the correct test and difficulty interpreting the test results, they said, and the lack of confidence in, uh, counseling families. So what should we do? And um, and so part of my re in, in reviewing this was so we're involved in we'll be talking a bit later about some of the screening test development work that we're doing. And so uh, we're trying to uh, decide what what should pediatricians do. And I'm not sure. And we can uh, other people uh, uh, have other ideas about this. I'm inclined to say we should always offer it. We should say that this is available. Um, I, I can tell you, and this is my personal opinion, I, I always get, I, I, I want to know about their family planning, and I, uh, um, whether this would, would affect their, those decisions. And then I, I, I wonder myself, if you wait a year, would you get more answers? Because the, uh, we're picking up on more stuff. And so should it be now, or should it be later? Uh, I'm feeling that there should be a discussion. 
at the very least. Any, anybody, uh, we're going to talk about um, identifying kids with autism uh, clinically and otherwise. Uh, but um, anybody want to comment about uh, genetic testing and what they do and their thoughts? Because uh, this is not a clear cut. Uh, I don't have a clear cut answer. Anybody else? New patients with autism. Um, I do recommend uh, chromosomal microarray and Fragile X. And now Fragile X is recommended for both males and females, by the way, if nobody, if people didn't know that as part of the workup. Um, so really, I, I noticed that in Norway, they said 75% get genetic tested. That's the highest. Uh -huh. Wow. Uh, so we here's do a not comment from Jim. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we do not have genetic testing for yeah. AS in Jakarta yet. You don't. Okay. No, we Got don't it. have it. Okay. Uh, don't have it. And yeah. Jan, who can't talk for some reason, she's, uh, she, her connection doesn't let that. She says uh, they can't get paid for it, so it's not offered, um, but we'll look for more Fragile X. I think that that's her intention is to say, yes, she could probably get Fragile X testing. And Fragile X actually is the most common genetic condition that's responsible for autism symptoms. Um, so. Uh, that's good to know about. I think my the other philosophy I have about it, and Ray and I, you, you and I have talked about this many times, is that there are families where they're not planning any more children, and there are families where they are planning more children. And that makes a difference to me in what I, how strongly I say, you know, we ought to try to find out um, so that you have some choice about this. Um, most of the families I see are not planning more children. The children are, are often a little bit older by the time they get to me. So I think that makes a difference. Whereas in primary care, um, you may be in a position where this is uh, the first child in the family and the expectation is that they may want to have another kid within two years, in which case you might not want to wait. So I would just say, you have to take that into account too. Well, and the other thing that should not go unsaid is that as pediatricians, we want to be looking for those syndromes like tuber sclerosis and and um, uh, and taking a very good family history. Uh, uh, anecdotally, I can tell you that I, just uh, being contrary, actually, when it came down to it, I uh, ordered a PKU test on a kid when I was in Connecticut at Yale, and uh, turned out to be positive. Uh, and uh, and they actually changed the law in Connecticut because of that kid, because it, at that time there was only. Uh, they only did the test once and, and may not have had enough milk exposure. So that's, that's a rare anecdote, but uh, that doesn't. Uh, so anyhow, pediatricians should be paying attention to it. Um, and uh, that's, um, we're, we're not in a state where we can offer it to everybody because of the even financial issues. And so, but considering it and talking about it, having the discussion is really important. Now, uh, so now I'm going to talk about identification. And um, first part of identification is uh, uh, Lewis syndrome. And how do we think about it? And how do we uh, recognize the, the behavioral phenotype that we're talking about? Um, now, this is a review that I, I came across. Um, and uh, as a review of uh, fMRI, uh, and they call it connectivity. Um, studies and uh, uh, you know when uh, so what they did is they tried out these different theories um, the, mostly psychologists and uh, when you were um, uh, engaged in an activity that is uh, thought to be related to a, a, the behavioral syndrome what lights up what, what parts of the brain are functioning and, and uh, so we'll get into that, but but some of the theories are are, are uh, important to just mention. And, and uh, Simon Baron Cohen is uh, the one who's attributed to to uh, uh, the theory of mind idea, and that is that uh, uh, the core, core problem being that uh, people with autism don't have a subjective idea of what the other person is thinking. That they don't the idea of how someone could have a false belief. That, they're, that either it's a fact or it's not a fact. It's not somebody can differ in their perception of the world. That is um, uh, an important uh, theory. 
uh, and uh, and there are paradigms to test for it, and and uh, they they got looked at in this uh, in these studies. Another uh, uh, notion that comes mostly from Simon Baron Cohen also is the idea, uh, and he called it extreme maleness. That is, uh, there are two ways. You know, um, equal rights notwithstanding, um, if more more boys have autism, more boys have ADHD, more boys are more likely to be uh, systematizing, systematizing with their lining up their trucks and trains and things like that, figuring that out versus the um, uh, more of a uh, capacity let's say, for empathizing, of course, uh, that, um, so, so that was uh, a theory, and that, that the autism spectrum, if you will, would include um, the male gender on one end. It could be it, 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 more extreme about that. Um, and then the idea about motor neurons, and this is uh, parts of the body that if you're watching someone, you're watching a basketball game on TV, and you feel that your arms are, are starting to shoot that that um, free throw, and uh, that uh, when you see something, some the the um, part of the brain that controls the action you're watching starts to get um, revved up. Uh, so that and then there's a, a, a school of thought that what we're dealing with here is poor executive functioning. Now, uh, the the all the parts you need to have a continual idea of what's happening at the moment. That's what you need some working memory, you need to inhibit, you have to have mental flexibility to change. Um, if it's not a routine thing, there's something different happening in the environment, you've got to be able to see it, plan for it, and also a theory of mind. So that that is um, uh, another point of view. And then there's the weak central coherence theory. And that is, a way of thinking about these individuals that they have trouble seeing the big picture. So they, and this would explain the uh, savant kinds of capacities in mathematics or engineering perhaps, or better to focus on parts rather than the big picture, the whole picture, and, uh, and weaker performance in uh, visual, spatial, perceptual, ver verbal, semantic things which require a... Uh, uh, is central coherence, getting the big picture, being able to see it, uh, rather than focusing on the details of, of uh, the, your perceptual field. So in, in thinking about these things, so this is a review, if you will, of all kinds of uh, functional MRI studies that were done with those kind of representative tasks to bring out these kind of theories. So they were looking at over connectivity, or is there under connectivity? In other words, when you're doing this thing, what lights up in your brain? And, and over connectivity might mean you have more parts of the brain that are, that are uh, uh, engaged, are, are uh, oxygenated, are um, uh, metabolizing glucose, but uh, maybe it's a typical part of the brain that the other, the control group guys don't have, or under. Um, you know, it just doesn't, just don't, those, those um, very neurons just don't light up kind of thing. So what the, the big picture here is that um, there was uh, evidence for under connectivity and particularly when they were social tasks. And then, you know, like the medial prefrontal cortex, posterior simulate cortex, uh, cortex, temporal lobe connectivity, weaker connectivity of the pre-central uh, and uh, superior frontal gyrus. Uh, so, and then there's evidence for under, can I, uh, over, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, over connectivity, a stronger connectivity, if you will, for uh, related to these severely restricted and, and uh, repetitive behaviors, as you might think. So is, is, are you going to really, really light up the part that's involved? <clears throat> and, uh, part of the brain that's uh, involved when you are doing these repetitive kinds of things. So I thought that was an interesting way to um, uh, understand uh, the clinical picture. Um, and, uh, and you can see these differences. So 
maybe you know functional MRI could could sort out uh, uh, whether you have autism or you don't have autism. But then <clears throat> people have looked at the brain imaging, MRI and CT, and this is another review. And in this review, they're trying to to see if you can pick out every little detail that could differentiate between a control and an autistic person and by machine learning, not just uh, a, a, uh, uh, looking at uh, volume, uh, in particular uh, the radiologist uh, view, but um, going bombs away and, and looking at every kind of difference in, uh, that you can see in an image. And, uh, and they're getting pretty good results. They talk about accuracies of 0.7 to 0.9. There are small samples. When you do machine learning, uh, you actually need to, and one of the problems I see with this is that they didn't, they have somebody's machine learning algorithms and that they that did one study, but they didn't take the same algorithm and try it in the next study. Everybody tries to reinvent it. And they tend to have more severe cases. And uh, we don't have a population uh, um, basis for doing this yet. So, but um, there are uh, neurological differences, and even even when you look at parents of individuals with ASD, um, there were, when you look and there, this is another review MRI, functional MRI, even the EG, and uh, both. Uh, they differ both in structural and functional. That's like the functional MRI. And some of these differences are not, are, show up in parents who don't have any uh, definable behavioral impairment either. So, um, and then, uh, some are in, in between kinds of, uh, between healthy controls and autistic kids. And, uh, um, so they're more, and, and if you, and if you, in these studies, uh, the parents who had more of these neural patterns, actually, you can measure they had more autistic traits. So again, a you know, broad phenotype of, um, you know, what is autism and how much, how much of autism do you have? Maybe it's not a yes, no, it's a maybe it's a how much. Um, and that's the idea of the spectrum. And, and you know, as we're talking about um, uh, genetic, the notion of finding the genetic answer um, and precision medicine, uh, you know, at the same time, uh, they've just uh, um, narrowed the, the diagnosis of autism, right? There were three flavors, and now it's one spectrum, right? So it's the opposite trend, but, but you can see why, because this is a, it's a how much kind of condition. So, and, and while we're at it, <clears throat> there uh, were a, a couple interesting studies looking at prospective, this prospective cohort of infants. Some were at higher risk because they had uh, family members who had autism. And they looked beginning at three months all the way to 36 months with uh, EEGs. And they, it's surprising how well they, they could predict uh, autism uh, diagnoses and, and of the kids who turn out to have autism, which ones had uh, language problems, and they had a correlation of 0.66 with the language scale of the Mullen. So, so um, there are all kinds of uh, promising brain imaging and um, uh, physiological uh, bio biomarkers, <clears throat> but um, they're not available at this time, and and uh, it, it's um, a little hard to imagine the world when we would have that. But so right now, there's another study I ran into this year, and they this was a um, uh, a focus group of uh, uh, African American families, and uh, they were talking about the expectation that uh, the pediatrician should pick up on this stuff now, not in some some fancy test. Uh, but um, and then the the uh, in the focus groups the uh, I think the sentiment that summarizes that we had to keep pushing they said because they had concerns they felt the concerns were ignored they felt it was a racial bias and uh, and there were other things legal things had gotten in the way there was some 
issues, cultural issues, and the denial, of shame that may have gotten in the way. But, but, um, um, but in fact, uh, we're not. Uh, um, uh, there's there are disparities in uh, pediatricians recognizing or uh, autism. You know, uh, anyone who's been making diagnosis, and you can see that um, Hispanics even more than African Americans, and when you look at, uh, you know, uh, those, the, the subtle, as I said, there's a whole spectrum, and uh, the mild ones, they're not getting uh, um, recognized. When, they, when, when uh, uh, African Americans are recognized, they're more severe, essentially, and they're more likely to have uh, intellectual disabilities, something more obvious. The subtle ones are not uh, being overlooked. And, and uh, in addition, uh, there are reports now of all the barriers that parents are, are uh, facing uh, to, uh, they understand that the early intervention can make a difference in outcomes and uh, how to access that. So <clears throat> we're back to screening and our friend, the M MJAC. Uh, and the MCHATs, the idea of screening actually started that the idea would be at 18 months would be the earliest. There's an immunization that's happening there. And the 24 months was actually when the first recommendations came out was actually a second thought because now, uh, 32 uh, percent or so of kids will not have autism at 18 months. They'll be normal, but, uh, they, uh, there's a regression that occurs, um, uh, and they may be picked up at 24 months. So that 24 months was to be a, um, a second chance. So, and, so um, uh, very interesting now. Um, and it, the, the MCHAT is clearly the, the, the screening test that's used all over the world, most popular for sure. Um, and it was used in Norway, and they had a birth cohort study, 52,000. Again, it was Scandinavians coming to teach us things. And they follow these kids, of course, and then they had assessments at three and nine years, and they went back and they saw, you know, what, you know, a lot of kids were missed at 18 months. If you look at this, sensitivity was uh, uh, only a third of the kids were picked up, and the positive predictive value they didn't use the, the follow-up interview was extremely low, and then. They started to look at um, who was who, who was missed, and the kids with normal IQs and less severe symptoms uh, were more likely to have a later diagnosis. And then uh, our article in Pediatrics this year uh, looked more carefully at this cohort, and they wanted to see what's the difference between the false positives and the true positives. And uh, and looking, and they looked back at, because they had at the same time they had the autism screen. They also had ASQ, and uh, they had a temperament measure. And they saw that uh, at that time, there was data that would say the uh, uh, boys were more shy, girls were less so. Um, there were more social communicating, fine motor problems in the kids who turned out to have uh, autism later. And again, uh, less severe kids are less likely to be found. So, um, the uh, MCHAT, so this is a, a, an issue that uh, we have gotten involved in thinking about uh, and have done some research on, and I'm going to show you what we've done. But first, this is what the, um, one of the authors of the MCHAT themselves, because the initial uh, studies, there were a lot of high-risk kids. Later on, they had low-risk, low-risk being kids who you'd see in your community pediatric practice. But in their own data, in the 18 months, it was a much lower positive predictive value, the percentage of kids who actually turned out to have a problem on diagnosis than the uh, uh, older kids. So we became interested in that. And uh, let me just say we did a study <clears throat> at, um, we published, and this is uh, uh, in Maryland, there were 11,000 kids we screened, and then we had about 100 who had uh, the um, diagnostic uh, battery of, uh, and, cl and uh, clinical impressions. And basically, we found also that under t 20 months, 
the MCAT, and even with the MCAT follow-up, there was a high, uh, was lower rate of accuracy. Now, <clears throat> what we did is we put together a number of measures in this sort of an almost machine learning decision trees, and uh, we found uh, that we could um, do better in less than tw uh, 20 months. But uh, we needed to replicate that, and, and we have now another, oh, before I did that. So we wondered about what is it at 18 months? Why are we missing these kids? And we did a study in uh, our uh, Chattis, uh, uh, large Chattis example, <clears throat> and uh, we found out that there is an excess of failure rates in the under 20 months. And uh, then we wondered what kinds of items are more likely to be failed. And uh, I won't go into the details here, but, but it was more likely that they were milestones that were established later, like does your child ever pretend? Uh, rather than does your child smile backwards, back to you, because that's something early infancy. So we had that idea, and that we had the idea also that um, uh, the um, MCHAT is a yes-no question. It, uh, all the items are yes-no. And But at 18 months, what we know from the way autism uh, evolves from prospective studies, it's not so much a yes, no. We thought it could be like a how much, especially the kids who are in the mildest uh, part of the spectrum. And that maybe the MCAT <coughs> with a uh, um, uh, yes, no score um, uh, is missing those kids. So basically, we looked at some tests that, that are available the POSI and the QCHAT, quantitative chat. This is a seven item, this is a 10 item one we used. And they have a how much kind of score, but they didn't score it that way. They scored it all yes or no. And, and the bottom line here, and by the way, in the autism screening literature, there's something else that was missing. And that is they didn't, none of the studies had um, kids who passed. What about kids who passed the screening test? Are we, it was assumed that they would be negative. But so we did a study, another 11,000 kids. We brought 410 kids back to have a, uh, uh, a full battery of uh, autism battery and um, developmental assessments. And, um, and we found that when you scored the POSI and the QCHAT together, you had better uh, predictive characteristics than here you are with an MCHAT. This is the current recommendations. Um, uh, sensitivity of 0.25. Uh, and then I'll just, uh, I'll just leave you with one last thing. And this is data, uh, this is data we presented. This is, uh, data we're analyzing, but I thought that, uh, just, uh, it fits in with some other things you said that when we did a kind of, it's not machine learning, it's called card analysis to try to say that we had the parents come back and they took a big battery of all kinds of items items from prospective studies, language items, all kinds of, uh, a lot of data on each of the kids who then had in this a sample of 400 uh, who passed or failed. And, uh, and with uh, this, this approach with only seven items and most 21 items uh, uh, predicting ASD and developmental dis uh, disorder, uh, we got a, a very high uh, percentage and this is not this is still something that's, that's ongoing now, and this is not our final result. But basically, um, maybe uh, these things are all related, and uh, we don't need to separate out autism and, and development because uh, those are well correlated in uh, the uh, genetics, in the uh, MRI, and everywhere. So, and so I'll stop right there and uh, ask for questions. Great, great. So, um, uh, th th thank you, Ray. You covered a lot of territory there, which is it it's very interesting and exciting, uh, even when it's not <clears throat> yet practical on a on a uh, on a primary care basis. Shirley, you had a comment about what happens. Th in this is something that we could recommend right now. This uh, dimensional Q chat and Posey. It uh, with this is without doing a follow up interview. Um, and it's 17 items rather than 20 items. So we're going to be recommending that. 
Right. So we're going to get that through the system so that uh, you can get paid for it the way you that you do for the M chat. That's really a matter of politics to get that to happen. Just to be clear about the dimensional one. So these tools already have all of the items showing a range of uh, how much the patient, the child is is showing those symptoms. But the way it's recommended for scoring doesn't include it. So that's what Ray was saying. So when you actually take into account what's available in the tools already, in the way you score it, you can improve it uh, when you combine the two tools. So that's basically what we're saying there. So, um, okay. Emily, uh, from a psychiatry point of view, yeah. I know that children with autism do end up with psychiatrists. I don't know what the trend is with that. Can you talk a little bit about how psychiatrists um, are thinking uh, or, or how they're handling children who come into them with autism at this point? Well, it somewhat depends on the age. You know, if they're the very young children, they don't see a general child psychiatrist typically. They may go to a child behaviorist or a, even a pediatric neurologist, or if they live in an area that has um, a specialized program. For example, like here, we have the Kennedy Krieger Institute. That would be um, a place where the very young, like preschool, like under five or six, would much more likely be to be seen than just seeing a general child psychiatrist, unless there are other kinds of problems, or perhaps the family has had a relationship with a child psychiatrist for other reasons for other children. Um, I think it ends up, particularly with these very young ones, it ends up being a fairly specialized set of resources that most child psychiatrists won't be as facile with, because you really do need to um, learn about you know, the level of detail that Ray was referencing about how do you evaluate, what are the basic tests you should do, don't need to do, what are the kinds of resources in your community, and you need to build relationships with those resources so that you really have your network of provider referrals so that you can optimally care for these youngsters and families. I would say that for the older group, you know, school age, you know, 10 to 18, those kids take their way to a child psychiatrist, they may have mild ASD, but they have ADHD or anxiety or depression that the regular treatments for which they may have been prescribed are not optimally fixing the problem. And so yep. we see the comorbidity, um, are those kinds of youngsters are more likely to present to a child psychiatrist, I would say, a general child psychiatrist. Um, when you know the SSRI for their depression isn't working, or they're not being able to tolerate stimulants for some reason, um, and that's what sometimes that's the first time that the ASD may get identified because it hasn't been so big and and noticeable in the very young age, but it is it can definitely be the rate limiting factor for why youngsters are not making being successful with peers, which really becomes prominent in middle school and gets worse as they get to high school. So sometimes the kids that we see, it may be the first time anybody has talked to them about the idea of ASD, um, and it's a function of them hitting developmental milestones that they're having trouble with. What do they say about their previous experience with their pediatrician when a psychiatrist is the first one to say the words ASD? Um, I, you know, I think sometimes, it really depends on how it's delivered. I mean, I don't think the issue is somebody missed this and this is why it's a problem because if it wasn't a problem, then there wasn't anything to pick up necessarily, right? So I think the way I try to think about it with families is, look, this is where we are. This is the reason you're, you've always thought your youngster was quirky. Quirky is great when you're in preschool. Quirky doesn't fly so well in middle school. So now that we're at a different developmental stage and the expectations are different, we're seeing what you may have found as charming or just, you know, eccentricities, interfering mm -hmm. with optimal developmental trajectory path. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think the issue is that somebody missed something. I don't think that's a helpful stance. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's more about this is where we are and this is why we're noticing at this point and what can we do about it now. Mm -hmm. I, think that's a, I think you said that extremely well. That, that the quirkiness is often endearing. Right. Um, to family These are the young Like we see, we can spot them in the waiting room, right? They're the, the kids yep. who arrive and on their t-shirt they have the periodic table. Right. 
And the parent the book, isn't that awesome? Books? He knows all the elements, and all we think is like, oh, <laughs> their kids aren't going to think that's awesome. <laughs> So <laughs> about blending and chilling is a new concept for some of these families. And it's tricky because many of these kids have lots of strengths and we often focus on their strengths, understandably. The problem is my responsibility as a child psychiatrist is to focus on their vulnerabilities so that they don't trip them up. Their strengths will be strengths no matter what we do, but their vulnerabilities and their weak areas are going to be what's their rate limiting factor. And that's how I talk to families about it. So Monica is asking, uh, how do we get the QChat and the Posy? Um, please write to us and we can help you because it's, uh, the scoring is different. Okay, so you can get those tools online, but you wouldn't know how to score them according to what we're doing. So uh, send it to bhoward at chattis.com. That would be fine. Um, and, uh, and Jan is also pointing out that they have a support group, um, but the support group is starting to say it's about from vaccines. So uh, there is a, a information about that, Jan, on the AAP website, um, and you can look there for some of the materials you might want to do that's got a nice big stamp of the AAP on it to help, uh, to help uh, explain to the families that this is not a vaccine issue.